Well, thank you. We're glad to have you tuning in to our program tonight. Uh, this program is What the Bible Says, and it's presented to you by the Blue Springs Church of Christ right here in wonderful Blue Springs, Missouri. My name is Donald, and sitting next to me is Leland, and we are going to be your hosts for the next hour. And tonight we're going to be answering the question, uh, are dealing with dangerous teachings that try to harm Christianity? We'll go through several of these. Let me give you some contact information here. Um, you can always call in. This is a live call-in program, uh, 816-229-2021. I'll give it to you again, 816-229-2021. And if you'd like to visit us, you're always welcome to our services. We meet on Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible class, 10.30 for worship. And again... Um, Sunday evening at 5 p.m. for evening worship, and we have a midweek Bible study on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and you are invited to join us. We assemble at 1000 Southwest Clark Road here in Blue Springs, Missouri. Uh, let me remind you, there will be contact information on your uh, screen and everything um, where you can uh, email us. Uh, you're welcome to write to us. We're at P.O. Box 1255. Blue Springs, Missouri. But I also want to mention to you um, this evening, and I think this is a, a great thing, Leland, um, we're going to be doing a fall gospel meeting, and it's going to be from October 4th to the 8th. So they've got one more week. This is the 27th. Be, be Sunday. October 4th. So yeah, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. That's we right. Take a break on Wednesday for schools. That's right. We take congregation go to their own congregation. Yep. So it's October 4th to the 8th with a break on the 7th. The topic is Christian growth, and these are lessons in growth from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. So we would like to have you join us for that. Again, if you have any more questions, you can contact us, and we'll be happy to visit with you. Um, we're going to go ahead and get into our topics this evening, and I think, Leland, they'll find these very informative. I hope they are. Um, you know, and that's our goal. You said it before we started. Um, it's not what do you and I think. It's right. what the Bible says that matters. What, yeah. what I think is no more important than anybody else thinks. But what the Bible says is the most important thing we can have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Leland, why don't you go ahead and take our first um, teaching that is harmful to Christianity, and I'll let you talk on that. And I've got to go get our phone. Yes. So take it okay. away. I'm on my own. <laughs> First thing I want to talk about is, is denominationalism, but I'm going to give some definitions here. The definition of an ism, a distinctive doctrine, cause, or theory, that's the first definition. The second one, an oppressive and especially discriminatory attitude or belief. A denomination is a church organization that exercises some sort of authority over the local churches that comp comprise it. Uh, the Church of Christ is autonomous. Each congregation is, is, is their own rule. They do, we do not have a, a board or something over a, a group of, of congregations. Uh, the word used as a noun is a religious group, usually including many local churches, often larger than, than a sect. An uh, example would be the Lutheran denomination. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. <clears throat> Open your Bibles to that and read with me if you would. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, in denominations we know... <clears throat> The different denominations teach different things, but Paul here is, is pleading with them, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. The denominations are not speaking the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. Well, there is divisions in the denominations. That's why there it's are. the denomination. They're divided. Absolutely. And be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For if it hath, for it hath been declared unto me of you... My brethren, by them that which are of the house of Cleo, that there is there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, or I am of Cephas, 
and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? That's the question you must ask yourself if you're a member of a denomination. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you were, were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, were you baptized in the name of uh, John Wesley or uh, Martin Luther, or you know, millions are. That, yeah, and that you've got to understand that Christ is not divided. You can't and. and when you, when you look at it and, and consider all the different teachings that the denominations have, That's true. Uh, there's something wrong. The Bible tells us plainly how we're to, you know, the things that we have to do, but they have different ways of going. Another one I want you to look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. And this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, in other words, to Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest some, somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be, may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, they're teaching you something false It's not simple. Christianity is simple. Yes, very simple. It's, and he goes on to say, For if he who comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well be put up with it. What Paul is saying there, Paul is saying he approves of them putting up, he, he does not approve of them putting up with somebody preaching a different gospel, but he's afraid that they will, will They'll do it. Do it. And that, that's what Absolutely. he's telling them there. I'm afraid that you will listen to a false gospel. And that, that's that's another thing. When that's, you don't know the true gospel, you'll fall for any right. gospel. And that, that, again, is a reason why you need to know the word. You know, First Timothy, or Second Timothy 3, 16, or is it First Timothy? I forget which. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Yeah, 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God of worker that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You got it. So we, we need to know God's word. Another another scripture I'd like to look for you to look to in, uh, on denominationalism is Galatians chapter one verses six through nine. And here again, Paul is talking to the Galatians. And he says, "I marvel that you are turning away so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a, to a different gospel. That is not another, but there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And that that's what denominationalism is." denominationalism is, is is perverting the word of God oh, yeah. to suit their 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 desires or beliefs. And we can't do that. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say now again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that what you have received, let him be accursed. So the thing is if you're if you're adhering to a gospel other than what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, and, and being a member of a, a church that is not following the Bible, you are going to be accursed. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you go to go to Second John nine through eleven. You know, if you if you bid them Godspeed, and if you're if you're worshiping with them, you're bidding them Godspeed. You're participating with error. You're participating with error, and you are guilty of the sin just as they are. Um, I had a question for you. Could you go through a list for us of all the denominations that are listed in the New Testament? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. There isn't any. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a short list. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, let's go back. You know, let's, uh, Go to Matthew 16, 18. There you go. I mean, here Jesus said, ask his, his, his disciples who the men say that he was. And they give different answers. And Peter come up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yep. And then in, in verse 18 of chapter 16 of Matthew, Jesus said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build My church. the Baptist church, oh. the Methodist church. Let me Wait, let me check that first. No. No, it doesn't say no. that. Jesus said, I will build my church. There it is. Now, my wife and I built our house 42 years ago. That house is not in your name. It's no. in our name. That's, that's Leland and Donna Reed's house. That's not that's not uh, Don Gillis's house. Right. 
I did not build your house. Christ built His church. He didn't build a Baptist church. He didn't build Martin Luther's church. Nope. And He didn't build the, the Presbyterian. He didn't build any of them. He built the church that He built with His name. Absolutely. There's a, a ton of verses that if you go, just, just read your Bible, if, if you've got a good concordance, it makes it easy. But just go in there and put church in there and look it up, everything that's said about church in the New Testament. You'll never find a denominational name in in there. Now, yep. the church is referred to sometimes as the Church of Christ, the Church of God, the uh, uh, Church of the Firstborn. Church born. of the Firstborn, all uh, referring to the church that Christ built. Absolutely. Uh, the church was established on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You can go read chapter 2 and you see Peter preaching the first gospel sermon there. If the church you're attending was established at a later date, then you're not in the church of Christ built. You missed the boat. Now, you know, uh, all you need to do is go, go to your computer, go to Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use, and put the name of your denomination in there and find out when it was established. That's it a good will point. tell you. That's a good point. Which means it was established by man and not by God. Uh, well, you'll say, well, the Church of Christ in Blue Springs is not founded in Acts chapter 2. Yes, it is. Well, it's the church that the Lord built. That's true. We were not established on the day of Pentecost. We're a congation, but uh, oh, well, yeah. let me expl explain that a little bit. If you yeah. if you plant a seed of corn, what do you get? What do you expect to grow? Corn. You're not going to get wheat. You're going to nope. get corn. Right. All right. If you plant the seed of the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, would you be a Baptist or a Lutheran or some other denomination, or would you member be a member of the body of Christ, the Church of Christ? You would be a member of the body of Christ because that's the seed that if was you if you plant that seed, that's what you're going to have. Absolutely. But if you if you distort that seed or, or mutate that seed, and that's what they're doing when they when they teach their false doctrine, they're mutating that seed, right? And they're not getting the church. They're getting a hyphenated, right? Hyphenated church, right? Another one you can look at is is First uh, Corinthians chapter three verse three, for you are still carnal. For where there are, are envy and strife and division, and that's what denominations are, division among you, you're not, you, are you not carnal behaving like mere men? So that, that, that's, that's what Paul's telling them telling in Corinthians when they were saying, I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas. And, you know, the question we have to ask, and you need to ask yourself, are you, is Christ divided? right he's not and uh first corinthians 1 thir 13 paul you know said is christ divided was paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of paul no so that that pretty well limits it there there are so many things that we can show in the scripture that proves denominationalism is false religion but but time of course tonight will not allow us to cover all of it We've got some other subjects we want to cover. However, let me say this. We would certainly be happy to sit down and study with you. Absolutely. And show you these scriptures. And, and there, there's a ton of them that, show, that shows that the church that Christ built is his church. It's not some denominational church. That's right. Well, thank you on that, Leland. I need to say something to our program manager. Jeff, if you are back there... Could you please run down to my office and get my phone? I have people texting me. It's coming over my iPad, so I've got some people that have uh, texted me questions. And if you can get that, I appreciate it. It's right on my desk. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Leland, thank you for giving us that understanding about denominationalism. And again, we're talking about dangerous teachings that harm Christianity. And it does. It harms. Um, when you were talking, I was going to tell you... Uh, I did a lesson, remember, we covered denominationalism, and I had a friend, and I was talking to this friend who um, is not in a sound congregation, and they were asking me about denominationalism, and, you know, I was giving them the, the standard answer, and I said, well, do you think all these denominations that are out there support one another? And, well, yeah, well, no, they don't. Do you think the Baptist preacher is telling people to go down the road to the Pentecostal church? No. I don't think so. 
You think the Pentecostals are saying to the Presbyterians, hey, let's, let's just join together and worship. No, they don't even have unity among themselves. Right. And so it just shows the fla fatal flaw. And, you know, they asked me, they said, well, you know, you're, you're saying that these denominations, you know, Baptist, Catholic, you know, make it easy, that they're not, they're not Christians, and, and you can't say that. And I said, well, you're right, the Bible says it, That's right. that they're not. But I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you, thank you, Jeff. We've had some text messages come through, and uh, we want to answer those. You can text me, uh, or you can um, call me. Anything's fine. But I said, do you, do you um, support all the denominations? Yes, I do. This is a, a lady I was talking to. Yes, I do. And I said, well, that surprises me. I didn't know that you um, supported Mormonism as, as being a valid... No, 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 no. I, I don't support Mormonism. What? Well, well, Wait a minute. Another denomination. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you said you supported denominations, and I throw one out. You say no, I don't. I don't support it. And so they're not even organized on what they believe. Well, they've agreed to disagree. They have. Oh, isn't that? That's yeah. That's the old standby. Well, then you know? here, here again, to stop and think about it. Now, God is a just God, and He's not the He's not the author of confusion. Right. So, if. The Baptists say this, and the Methodists say this, and the Catholics say this, and you know, on down the road. That's confusion. If you go to God's Word and, and, and study it and see what God says, there's no confusion. That's right. He tells no. you plainly how we're to worship. He tells us how we're to be saved. He, there, there's nothing left to, to, to wonder about. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you, Leland, on that. Uh, I'm going to deal with the issue of materialism, and you you already explained to them we're we're focusing on these isms. Yeah, right. And so I give them a definition of ism. I was running down. <laughs> I was running down to get the phone when you did that. Um, so I, I want to share with you what the Bible says about materialism, and the reason why I chose this is because this is very popular today. This uh, concept of the uh, name it and claim it doctrine. And when we talk about materialism, um, there's some key people out there that preach this doctrine of materialism. And it's called the prosperity gospel. If you are faithful and you give a whole lot to the church, then God is going to bless you with money. It's just going to rain down out of heaven for you. And you have people like Joe Olstein, who sometimes bases his whole message on, if you give, 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 then God will give, 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 give to you. So the more you give, the more God gives you. You know, um, it's just, it's a never-ending thing. Um, they want to sell you products. They want to do all these things. They want to focus on you giving them money. So you have people like Joel Osteen. You have uh, Rod Parsley, who's not on TV as much as he used to be. Uh, and you have Kenneth Copeland, who was in the news about three months ago dealing with his second private jet that he had. Um, so I guess materialism has worked for Kenneth for him, Copeland. Anyway. Yeah, it has. Um, I heard a... How many, li how many little old ladies have sent him money that, that they needed for food or, or medicine? That's right. That's right. You know, uh, well, they're going to fall between the cracks. Because, you know, not only do you... You know, these ministries, these, I mean, these men, they don't answer to anybody. You think anybody's going to tell Joe Osteen, oh, hey, um, we don't want you to do X, Y, Z. No, he's running the show. Sure. So this... Prosperity gospel is a terrible thing, friends, that is out there um, in the world today. And, of course, it's unscriptural. And uh, I gave you a couple names of people. Um, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 with me. 1 Timothy in chapter 6. And go down to verse 10. 1, Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. And Paul, as he writes to Timothy, says these words. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith into their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, I don't know if you want to read that in Greek or English or Spanish or whatever language you want to read it in, there is no way that verse 10 is going to tell you that the prosperity gospel is acceptable. No. There is no way. And so this pursuit of I just need more, more, more. I need a bigger house. I need a newer car. I need you know this big vacation and that big vacation and this and this and this. It's just chasing after material things, um, which you know they they set up those material things as their as their god. What little you, G. What do you do with what Peter says? In, uh, Money and gold I do not have. No. Uh, what I give you? What's going to happen at the end of the world? 
Oh well, perishable things like yeah. gold and silver are not gonna not gonna do you any good. Is that in? I forget what. Yeah. You mean. It's in, uh, in one of one of yeah. Peter's epistles. Well, you look. Go over to Luke with me. That's y'all. Sorry, Leland. Go over to Luke. Um, uh, chapter twelve. Luke chapter 12, and um, go down, if you will, uh, to uh, verse 13. I might, let me see if I'm going to back up. No, I'm not. Uh, so most of you have a little subheadings in your Bible. Uh, they're not inspired, but they, they give you a little heads up sometimes of what's taking place. And you probably have a Bible, and I hope you have your Bible open. Uh, it's called the Parable of the Rich Fool. Um, and it says this beginning in verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. And we don't often hear a lot of lessons on that. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Now, I'll stop there for a minute. Now, you will never hear that preached in the prosperity gospel. You're not going to hear. I um, I actually saw this firsthand. Um, it was a YouTube clip of a message that um, Joe Olstein was preaching, and he tells this story. This name and claim it. He says, uh, "I went to the hospital to visit somebody, and the parking lot was packed. So I said, Lord, Lord, I need a parking space. I need a parking space.' And he prayed, and he drove around, and there was no, Lord, Lord, I need. A, he drove around. He said, drove around for about ten minutes, and Lo and behold, there was a parking space for him. And he thanked the Lord for it. You know, I've watched the parking lots too, and I found he drove around. Sure enough, one opened, one opened up eventually. Up. So, so I didn't ask the Lord. And yeah, <laughs> you should up. have. That's the name it and claim it, you know. This thing's through material wealth. Um, let me go down to verse 60. Stay there in, in Luke chapter 12. It says this, Then Jesus spoke a parable to them, saying, Now listen to what he says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many good, uh, good things laid up for you for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who will those things be which you have provided? He says, so it is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now here's what we're not saying, Leland. We're not saying that a man cannot be wealthy. No, because look at Abraham and look at Job. There you go. Both we're, of them were very wealthy. They were. Um, the tax collector, as far as we know, was a wealthy fellow. Of course, he got some of that gain, you know, on uh, 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 unsavory. Unsavory. The, the issue isn't, can I have wealth? Well, that's not the problem. If you look at what Jesus says here, the problem is that he's putting his material things before God. He's not going to thank God. He, if he doesn't in this parable that Jesus says. He doesn't thank God for a single thing. No. It's, I will do this. No I'll build. You know, Then I'll take it easy. I'll and so, it my soul. Yeah, that's right. So, so the issue is, Allowing money to become uh, more important than a relationship with God. And that's where the, the focus is. And when I talk about Osteen and Parsley and, and Kenneth Copeland, um, that, friends, that's what they're doing. They are encouraging people to put money before God. You know, and if that's not true, or we've got anybody who is watching tonight and you don't think that's true, well, you go ahead and call in. Or, um, you know, you email or, or do anything, the information will be on your screen. Better yet, have your pastor call me. Yeah. I'll be happy to talk to your pastor. Um, you know, have him call me or your reverend doctor or monsignor or priest or whatever. It is. You know what? They won't call. You know why? Because they can't answer these verses. Uh, they can't answer what Scripture says because of their unscriptural doctrine. No, I welcome, I welcome phone calls from everybody. I usually don't get them because they don't want to stay with just the Bible. Well, you know, years ago, many years ago, there used to be a lot of debates between members of uh, preachers of the Church of Christ and, and denominations. That's right. But denominations won't debate anymore because they cannot 
prove their stand. No. And they can't, they, they really can't refute, well, they can't, absolutely can't refute the, the Scripture. You, you don't see, a, you're, you're right, you don't see the level of debates that we used to have in the 40s and the 50s um, because they're not willing to meet us at the table. Or they have unreasonable demands. Um, you know, if we're going to uh, have a, a debate over once saved, always saved. Well, we only want these certain scriptures being used or this. Used. Well, no, friend, if it's in the Bible, we're going to use it. We want the Bible. Yeah, we want the Bible. So in materialism, what you have is you have trusting in money more than God. And, and the reason why I say that is because when that person is encouraged to send in money, how are they trusting in God? They're trusting in their money. I have to send in the money for God to bless me. Right. Well, now that's yeah. Yeah. No, that's God will bless you when you're faithful. That's right. God will bless you when you're obedient. And you know the truth of the matter is, and who knows, we we'll, might get a phone call. The truth of the matter is that you can be poor and still be a faithful Christian. Well, a good example. You know? That's a rich man and Lazarus. Rich man. Oh, yeah, that's a real good example. Lazarus was very poor. A lot, you know. The people, realm. Don't, yeah. what people don't realize, you know, the rich man went to, to torment and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. bosom. But uh, Lazarus didn't go to Abraham's bosom because he was poor. Right. He went to Abraham's bosom because he was faithful. Absolutely. And the rich man went to torment because he was unfaithful. He was unfaithful. He had a responsibility right. to his fellow man. Right. And he didn't do it. That's a good point. Um, so we just want to make sure that when we're talking about this, uh, that people understand that the issue isn't can I have wealth? Yes. The issue is are you putting your wealth before God or are you trying to use your wealth as the door to get you an entry into God? That kind of makes you think of uh, Simon the Sorcerer trying to buy gift of the Holy Spirit. Gift of the Holy Spirit. A miraculous gift. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, what we're trying to do with our wealth is to bribe God into letting us be in, get, come into heaven. Well, sure. We talked about um, uh, was it last week the ca the Catholic uh, yeah, the, indulgence? Yeah, yeah. You know, helping your loved one get out of purgatory, purgatory quicker because yeah. you gave money. Um, I, I have one more here, and then we'll throw it back to Leland. Uh, Matthew chapter six, verses uh, nineteen through twenty-one. Matthew six nineteen through twenty-one. And again, this is Jesus who's doing the speaking. And he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Follow what he says. Where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What is your treasure? Are you, is your treasure, I need more, I want more, i got to get more? Um, you know, you can be a hardworking businessman, but you can't have all your focus on money and then say that you've, your heart can love both of them. Well, your heart can't. Uh, because if that's what you treasure is your money, you're not treasuring God. You can't you know? serve God and mammon. And mammon. mammon. Mammon, that's right. You can't do it. But so again, you've got to come back to what Peter said. It's going to happen when, when Christ comes back. Everything here is going to burn up. That's right. That's right. Now there, where is your treasure? If your treasure's here on earth, it's gone. It is. If your treasure's in heaven, that's where you're going to be. I got a letter from a Jehovah Witness. <clears throat> I haven't responded back uh, to it. Been been a little busy with the gospel meeting. Um, but in the letter, she said, uh, "You know, do you want to spend eternity on this recreated world where it's going to be everything's going to be great and you're going to live here with Jesus and God and everything?" And the first thing I thought about, uh-uh, it ain't going to be here. No, it's not going to be here. <laughs> it's not going to be here. You know, Paul talk about, talked about three different types of heaven. The, the Bible talks about three different types of heaven. The first heaven is, is, you know, where we live, you know, the atmosphere, birds fly. The second heaven is what we would call outer space. Third heaven is where Uranus is where God lives. And Paul says that he was called up one time into the third heaven. And he saw those wonderful things. Now, if my... Reasoning is right. Earth is not the third heaven. No. So you know when. Listen, when when eternity comes and Christ returns and we we go to um, either heaven or hell, this ball of rock isn't needed anymore. You well, know, it's going to be burned up. What, what did Jesus say? Well, if I go, I will come again and take you. Take you to where you know. I'm paraphrasing here, but take you back where he was. He went to prepare a place for them. 
That's right. It's not here on earth. So that 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 theory is wrong about living on a, on a regenerated earth. That is. We we've talked about that before, and uh, maybe again in, in the future we might again. Yeah, we'll cover it. Um, let me remind you one more time that this is a live call-in program, and I do have the phone. Uh, you are welcome to call in with your Bible question at eight one six. 229-2021. Let me give it to you again. 816-229-2021. And we encourage you to call in so that we can have discussion with you from the Scriptures. Leland, you got another one for us. Did you have some text questions? Uh, no, they, okay. Were, um, okay. they were about audio issues. Okay. All right. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is emotionalism. What? Yeah. You know, people. You know, I, I remember one time when I was I was a teenager, a preacher, and my brother and I went out to talk to this lady, and she told us, she said, "I know I'm saved because I feel it, feel it right in my here. heart. Yeah. Feel it in my heart." Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Let's look. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. That's Matthew 15, 15 through 20. Then Peter let's answered. Up a little bit oh, here. Okay. Here we go. Now can you hear it better? Okay. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do, not, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is, is eliminated? And you're wondering, what's this got to do with it? But hang with me. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they de defile a man. For out of the heart, and this is what we're talking about, out of the heart, Proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with, with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So what Jesus is telling them here, the heart, you can't trust your heart. No. And then no. Uh, we have to trust God's teaching. Uh, another thing he's telling the disciples that he, he uh, we can't trust our feelings. We need to know and understand God's word. Again, Second Timothy 2.15, study. Study, show thyself approved. But Jeremiah said in, in Jeremiah 17.9, that's Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we can we trust her heart? Then turn to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. That's tw Proverbs 28, verse 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whosoever walks wisely will be delivered. Now, what does he say when he's talking about walking wisely? That's walking according to God's word. That's right. That's walking wisely. Then Jeremiah 10:23. That's Jeremiah 10:23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own step. What what God is saying through Jeremiah is that we need something to direct us, and it's not our heart. It's God's word. That's right. Uh, and then Psalms 37, 40, 37 23. Uh, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Now, how are they ordered? That's a question you must ask. How are they ordered? It's by God's Word. Look at Psalms 119. That's Psalms 119, starting in verse 116. Uphold me according to your word, yep. that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up and I shall be safe and I shall observe your statutes continually. The psalmist made it very plain that we must follow God's statutes continually not our emotions. Uh, Agree. That's, I mean, what else can you say about emotionalism? Emotion, emotions will not save us. Now, does that mean that let me, let me go on here. Does that mean that when, when Somebody obeys the gospel and I am not happy. I mean, I'm, my, my heart is full of joy when somebody obeys the gospel. When I obeyed the gospel, there was a relief there. You know, I remember I was 15 years old and we didn't have a baptistry where we was going, so we drove over to Oak Grove. And I'm thinking all the way over, I hope we don't have a crash. Yeah. And I get killed because I, I knew I wouldn't be saved. It was it was relief to me to be baptized because I knew that my sins had been wiped away, and that that's 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 a good feeling. But why did I know that? Because of God's word. It wasn't because I felt it in my heart. Right. My heart was happy 
because I knew what God did. He took my sins away when I was baptized. It's true. That made me happy. And that, that's that's what the, where your feelings are good, but we cannot depend on our heart to guide us. You're right. The, the feeling comes after. Right. The joy and the excitement comes after. You've been clothed with Christ. You've been baptized. And then there's that excitement. You know, there's that good feeling. But a lot of people in the religious world, the emotion comes before, and then they'll deal with with the text or anything, but you're right. I know that I'm saved because I feel it in my heart. Well, that proves every religion right. right. Because the uh, the Islam could say, the a Muslim could say, um, well, I believe that Muhammad is, is my Savior because I feel it in my heart. Or, you know, you get this from people who grew up in denominations. Um, well, I know, I know that the Methodist church is right. It's this deep feeling burning in my heart. Well, you know, Paul was guilty of that. He thought he was right in, in persecuting the church. That's right. He felt it in his he heart. He felt it in his heart. He was, you know, I mean, he, he believed, absolutely believed that he was doing right. Yep, that's right. When he found out different, though, he changed his ways. And, and that's, that's the thing that we're encouraging people to do now. Open your Bibles. Study God's Word. Don't take our word for it. Don't take your preacher's word for it. Study God's Word and see what God said. That's why we always give book, chapter, verse. You said that last night in your lesson. That's why we give back book, chapter, verse. That's what we want. Um, again, you can call us. Um, our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you with your Bible question, 816-229-2021. I'm Donald, and this is Leland, and we are members here at the Blue Springs Church of Christ, and we're just simply Christians, New Testament Christians. Well, thank you, Leland, for that. Um, my next one is on premillennialism. And I'll say it right off the bat, um, and th those who are involved in premillennialism will know this, there's different types of premillennialism. There's post, there's pre, there's dispensational premillennialists, there, and there's all kinds of different. Well, we're looking at premillennialism um, itself, pre-before the millennium, premillennialism. And one of the big uh, proponents of this doctrine is the Baptist Church. And it is an, infectio an infectious error. And it promotes the idea that when uh, Jesus returns and there's this reign, that he's going to establish his throne on earth and he's going to have this period of ruling. Now, one of the big problems with that, and we'll begin with <laughs> several, but one of the things that we'll begin with is the understanding that Jesus is not coming back to put foot on this earth again. And it reminds me of of First um, Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. Encourage everybody to turn over there, and it reminds me of what's being said there in um, what did I give you? First Thessalonians four and verse seventeen, four and verse seventeen, and talking about now when we're talking about the end times, it's called eschatology. And eschatology is simply a study of what's going to happen at the end times. Now. We are in the Christian dispensation, so we're in the last days, right? I, I, Leland and I don't know how long that's going to last, and you don't know how long that's going to last, but we are in the end times right now. And so eschatology is the study of what's going to happen in the end times, all right? Follow along with me. There's two different types of eschatology. There's individual eschatology and general eschatology. So individual eschatology asks the question, where do you go the moment you die until Jesus returns? That's individual. Where do you go? Well, we know the Hadean world, uh, realm and all that. <clears throat> the second part, general eschatology, asks the question, where does everybody go from the second coming for eternity? And a lot of times when you're looking at eschatology, they get that mixed up in the New Testament. They call what's individual eschatology general, and then what's general individual. So you, you have to be real careful. So we're dealing here in premillennialism, we're dealing with the end times, eschatology. We're dealing with a thought process that um, just distorts what the Scripture says about the return of Christ. And as we mentioned there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, it says this, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, now notice, Leland, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And it is comforting. Look how he begins. Then we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them 
in the clouds to meet the Lord. That, that's encouraging. Right. right? But notice, He's not coming back to reign on earth. He's not coming back to, to walk on the earth to, to uh, you know, have everybody resurrected here and there's this kingdom that's set up. His kingdom, yeah. You know, it, it, does, it doesn't work. Now, I, I understand why it's attractive. You know, I understand why it's attractive. Because in, in its... In its simplest form, and we've got people, I'm sure, who are premillennialists out there that are watching, but in its simplest form, different aspects of premillennialism give you a second chance. Right. Because if you, if you, during the tribulation, you have the opportunity, you know, to become faithful. Um, what do I always say, Leland? There's no second chance at the second coming. That's it. Your fate yeah. is fixed. Luke 16, uh, the rich man and Lazarus, or 19. No. Your, your 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 fate is fixed. So I can see why that's. Well, look at look at Second uh, Thessalonians one seven. Oh yeah. Let me go backwards here. Go ahead. Then to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with. Temporary, no, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So what is going to happen when Jesus comes back, the second coming? He's coming in flaming fire to take vengeance on those that know not God and have obeyed not the gospel of Jesus Christ. No second That's chance. No second chance. No second chance. And you know, we, 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 we say these things with the understanding that we want all people to be saved. Right. You know, when when you are a New Testament Christian and you've obeyed the gospel plan of salvation, and you're living faithfully. You're not fearing the second coming of the Lord. In fact, you're kind of longing for it because you know the blessings that will come when when Jesus Jesus Christ returns. Uh, go ahead. Well, you know, back to Lazarus and the rich man. You know, the rich man was in torment. He wanted Lazarus to come over and just dip his finger in water and put it on his tongue. That's right. Of course, Lazarus couldn't do that. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, which is paradise, which is a very good place to be. Absolutely. You know, heaven is going to be even better than paradise. Yeah, both of those are, are temporary <clears throat> places. Uh, Abraham's bosom, where the rich man was, is that place where he'll wait till the second coming and go to heaven. There's no teaching of anybody being in in um, paradise, paradisia. That's where Jesus said the rich man I mean, where Jesus said the thief on the cross was going to be, today you'll be with me in Paradisia, not Uranus. So, you know, there's that place of paradise where those people go to heaven. And then those who are in Tartarus, those who are in that place of agony where you crave for one drop, uh, their fate is hell. Right. So there's no crossing over or changing anything. It's no, the way it is. There's a great gulf between it. Neither, neither can go either way. That's right. That's right. Um... Go over and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I hope you're turning with us in your Bibles. Go up 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. And again, we're dealing with different aspects of premillennialism, and we understand that they're waiting for Jesus to set up his kingdom. Well, his kingdom is already in place, and the kingdom is all, people, uh, he, it's already reigning. Listen to what it says. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Okay? So you have the understanding that the kingdom is in existence. Okay? It's here right now. Uh, the kingdom and the church are one and the same. The kingdom is the blood bought. The church is the blood bought, right? The kingdom is those who are redeemed. Christians are redeemed. I mean, it's just the, the kingdom has Christ as head, the church has Christ as head. They're, they're interchangeable. So there's no need for us to wait for Christ to come back and set up this earthly kingdom. We're living in the kingdom right. time right now, you know. And I think that's hard for some people because, again, that second chance that they might get, you know, this this there's a series hugely popular. I mean, Leland, this the book series sold millions. It's called Left Behind, and it sold millions. It's probably still a bestseller these days. And it's, it has the tribulation and all the things that are going to happen to the people, the rapture, the rapture, that there are going to be people who are left on earth and, you know, persecution, and, and then, you know, hopefully things will turn out good for them. Uh, but they made a movie out of Left Behind, and it starred Kirk Cameron, who, who promotes the most false doctrine you could ever imagine. 
Um, it's just, he was on that TV show, Growing Pains. You probably don't remember it. No. Yeah. I, I you, didn't watch it. You were probably watching Gunsmoke yeah. or uh, what's that one? Uh, the Valley? The Big No. What's, what's the Big that? Valley. The Big Valley. Is that what Hoss is and all no, that? No, that, that was... Uh, I can't think of that. Oh, man. You know what I'm talking about? I know you're talking about. Rawhide. No, it wasn't no. Rawhide. Well, whatever it was. Somebody call him and tell us. The Cartwrights. Cart that's right. Um, so, <laughs> I don't know why that came to my mind, but it, <laughs> it did come to my mind. But Kirk Cameron is a false teacher. And he is such a polished and very easy person to listen to. Very easy person to listen to. But he promotes this doctrine of, of the rapture of left behind. And, you know, the thing about that is think of all the millions of people, well, in the denominations as well, think about all the millions of people who think they're okay right. because these false teachers have told them they're okay. And, friends, they're not okay. And if you're in a denomination, you're not okay. You know, you need to get out of your denomination. You know, go ask your, go ask your reverend doctor pastor or your bishop. Go, go ask them to show you your denomination in the Bible. That's right. I want to see where it says Baptist Church. So ask, ask them, where does it say Baptist Church? Well, I've had some of them tell me that John the Baptist was the one who started the church. That, yeah. That he, yeah. If he did, he... He didn't know it. He didn't, he didn't know it. <laughs> did he start it before Christ built his church? He, he, he did, because, you know, when Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build John the Baptist... Oh, wait, he doesn't say no. that. And what, did, my what did Jesus say about uh, the least in the kingdom is greater than John? That's right. The Baptist. It, it's funny how doctrine gets twisted. But, you know, I, I tell people that, you know, it, the probably the largest number of people that I come in contact with are usually of the Baptist faith. You know, and I use quotation marks faith. Um, that's usually who I, I come in contact with. There's 50 million Baptists in America. It's the largest denomination in the United States. Now, Catholic is the largest worldwide. They got some of 50, 58 million, you know. I'll tell you another interesting thing about that is they have about 14,000 congregations, and so do we. So we've got just as many as they do, but, but less numbers. We've got people who are faithful. We've got people who aren't following denominationalism. We've got people who are understanding that, like I said, you go to your pastor and ask him to show you your church, right? Not the word church. Church is all throughout the Bible, and that is the, that is the church that Christ built. So you ask your, your pastor, reverend, doctor, show me the Methodist church. Where does it say that? Right? The Episcopal, church. the Lutheran church, the Catholic church. Show me. And they won't. They, they can't. can't. It's, not, it's not there. Again, our plea is that you listen to what the Bible says. Absolutely. That's that's the whole thing that we need to do, and we're coming up to our... We are. We're coming up to the end of our... i got my bifocals on, so I can't see that clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but i got one right here. Um, are we going to continue with the other ones next week, or what do, what uh, do we want to do? We can if you want. Uh, Let's give it a chance. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, carry this study over to next week, and I'll just throw out some of the topics that we'll cover. We're going to talk about deism, nihilism, individualism. Oh, that would go with your, you should take that one. And then progressivism. Um, we're going to look at all those different isms that uh, seek to harm Christianity. Well, let me remind you of a few things again. Um, you can always call us at area code 816-229-2021. If the phone is not answered, I'm here during the day, and if, if by chance you miss me and I don't answer the phone, please leave a message. I'll call you back. If you call, I'll call you back if we missed your call. I like talking, don't I? Yes, you do. I like talking, so I'll talk to you. Um, or you can come visit us at 1000 Southwest Clark Road, and uh, um, you can come, come during our study times. Let me give you our, our, um, our um, website, www bluespringcofc.org You can Google us on Facebook. Say Blue Springs Church Christ and you'll get all the information that you want. Brother Leland, I think you made some great points. Oh, yes. Hey, look. We are having our um, fall gospel meeting. It's going to be from October 4th to the October 8th. And our theme is Christian growth. Lessons in growth from Second Peter chapter 1, 
1 through 10, and I know the speaker who is speaking for us in that series, and he is outstanding. Absolutely. So my wife told me she's coming to hear this guy. Okay. You know, she's married to the speaker, but she's coming to hear me. Listen, we'd love for you to come and join us. It's going to be each night, well, Sunday morning at 9, 10, and 5, but during the week, it's going to be at 7 p.m., Monday, Tuesday, and then on Thursday. Each of those nights is at 7 p.m. We'd love to have you as our guest. Remember what we always say, you'll always find a friendly welcome where? At the Church of Christ. At the Church of Christ. Thank you all very much.